won't have escaped our attention that Europe is currently in the grip of a huge migration crisis. Staggering numbers of people are on the move. The biggest mass migration apparently since the Second World War. And these people have come uh, to Europe across the sea, a lot of them via Greece, into Hungary, hoping to move onwards uh, to Austria, Germany, and other European countries. And we read in the press and see on the television how that many of them have made this journey across the sea at tremendous personal risk. And we have learned that there have been many thousands of deaths. And I'm sure we've all been moved by the plight of these people, and especially at the picture of that little boy who lost his life and had to be carried out of the sea. So the question is, what is the current cause of this migration crisis? Well, there's a number of factors that are driving it, but by far and away, the greatest cause is, in fact, the current state of civil war in Syria. People have been driven from their homes in fear of their lives, and, and who can blame these poor people for wanting to leave the nightmare that is Syria behind and to search for a better life elsewhere. So it seems that whilst the Syrian crisis uh, is being played out many thousands of miles away from where we are today, it is nevertheless having its effect on the world very close to home. And as time goes by, this effect is going to increase as European countries, including our own, are under pressure to accept more and more refugees. And so the Syrian crisis that's been dominating the news in the past few days is the main thing that is driving this current uh, migration into Europe. So the question is, well, where did this civil war in Syria come from? What's, what's the fighting all about? Well, it's been going on now since 2011, when a series of pro-democracy protests against the Assad regime erupted in Syria, and hundreds of thousands of people uh, took to the streets. <clears throat> and with time, the violence escalated, and the country eventually descended into full-scale civil war, as rebel brigades were formed and started to battle against government forces for control of individual cities. So that's how it all started, and since then, the civil war has acquired sectarian overtones, because President Assad is an Alawite, so he is a member of the Shia Muslim sect. And the majority of the rebels fighting against President Assad are Sunni. And added into this mix, of course, is the rise of Islamic State and other jihadist groups. And we know how that IS has capitalized on the chaos in Syria and has been able to uh, take control of great swathes of the country. Now, we may remember that back in 2013, the civil war took a very sinister turn when uh, evidence came to light that forces loyal to President Assad were suspected of using toxic chemical weapons. And in fact, it, it's alleged that the Assad regime uh, is still, even now, using chemical weapons against its enemies. And innocent civilians, like this little boy here, are suffering in the process. And so in response to this, and also to the rise of IS in Syria and Iraq, a US-led coalition of forces has conducted airstrikes in both Syria and Iraq in an attempt to primarily to degrade Islamic State and also to drive President Assad himself out of power. And on top of all this, events in recent days have raised the stakes in Syria even further because over the past few days, President Putin of Russia 
has chosen to intervene in affairs in Syria by sending large quantities of military hardware. And over the past few days, the Russian Air Force have been carrying out airstrikes and also yesterday uh, the ships in the Caspian Sea sent cruise missiles into targets in Syria. And of course the concern uh, in the West is that Russia's intentions are totally different to those of the West. The West is seeking not only to destroy Islamic State but also to bring the Assad regime down. Whereas, of course, Russia, in contrast, is seeking to prop up the Assad regime. And so the situation today is extremely volatile. And it's easy to see how that the whole thing could degenerate into a full-scale proxy war between Russia and the West. Not to put too fine a point on it, it's, a, it's an absolute mess. This map from the BBC website just gives us a flavour of how complicated the uh, situation has become in Syria because it illustrates how many different groups are involved in the fighting. And the consequence is that there has been loss of life on a truly colossal scale. And only over four million people have now been displaced as a result of the war in Syria. And certainly as far as today's news is concerned, there doesn't appear to be any end in sight to the fighting. Russia's entry into the theater of war runs the risk of, of prolonging and intensifying the conflict rather than reducing it. And so there's very little cause from the human point of view for optimism. And the solution to this crisis is very difficult to envisage. So that's the, the situation as it stands today. Now, I'm talking to you tonight on behalf of the Nottingham Christadelphians. Now, we are a group of Bible believers. We have no political axe to grind at all. So this is not going to be a political talk. But we expect, we believe that the current turmoil that is happening in Syria, in the Middle East at the moment, is nothing more than what we would indeed expect from what the Bible has to say. Now, we don't claim to have any uh, particular uh, special revelation from God. We base our beliefs purely and simply on what we read in the Bible. Because, you see, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, the Word of the living God. And we believe that the Bible predicts a time of great trouble in the Middle East, which will be orchestrated primarily by Russia. And the focus for this great conflict that the Bible talks about will ultimately be that little nation that sits immediately to the southwest of Syria's borders, the nation of Israel. So that's what we believe that the Bible teaches. But the good news is, that we want to share with you tonight, that the Bible also tells us that this future time of trouble will be the prelude to a time of great peace and prosperity for the world, with the establishment on the earth of the kingdom of God. And that's really what we want to discuss with you tonight. So first of all, what I'd like to do is to show to you what the Bible says about Syria. And to see this, we're going to need to, to travel back in time, way back in time, to about 600 years before the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to join the company of one of the Old Testament prophets, the prophet Daniel. Now, many of us will have heard about Daniel. We might be familiar with uh, the story of Daniel in the lion's den. But I want us to take a look at a, what I think is a fascinating prophecy that God gave to Daniel when he was a very old man. And it's found 
in the prophecy of Daniel and chapter 11. We're just going to look tonight at three Old Testament prophecies. And this is the first one, Daniel chapter 11. Now, at this time in his life, Daniel lived in the kingdom of Persia during the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And in the third year of the reign of Cyrus the Persian, Daniel was given this remarkable prophecy that we have recorded for us in Daniel chapter 11. So we're just going to read together verses 2 through to 4. It says there, And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity. So let's just stop there for a moment. What Daniel is told by God here is that there would be three more kings in Persia, and then a fourth king who would be richer than them all. And after that, another king would stand up in opposition to Persia, but his kingdom would be divided into four towards the four winds of heaven. And historically, we know that this was precisely what happened. So here's the next three kings of Persia. And then the fourth king was this king, a fabulously wealthy man called Xerxes. And then along came this man that we'll all have heard of. This is Alexander the Great. And with tremendous speed and ferocity, Alexander the Great conquered the whole of the Persian Empire, culminating in a famous battle, the Battle of Issus, that took place in 333 BC. So that was the end of the Persian Empire. Now, Alexander the Great, tremendous warrior that he was, he died at the peak of his powers when he was only 33. And after he died, his mighty empire, the Greek Empire, was then divided into four by his four military generals, just like Daniel 11 here says that it would. And here they are on this map. There was Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. So there were four Alexander's four generals. But of these four, two of them became more important than the other two. And they were Seleucus in the north here and Ptolemy in the south. And these two kingdoms become known in Daniel chapter 11, in the rest of this chapter, as the king of the north, that's Seleucus, and the king of the south, that's Ptolemy. Now, Ptolemy, the king of the south, as you can see from the map here, he occupied Egypt. But the center for operations for Seleucus, the king of the north, was the country that we now know as Syria. So here's the first important point that we get from Daniel chapter 11, that the country of Syria today occupies the territory of this ancient king of the north, the kingdom of Seleucus that we read about here at the beginning of Daniel chapter 11. Now, just before we go any further, it's worth pointing out how remarkable this little section of Daniel chapter 11 is. We've only read verses 2 through to 4, and yet history confirms that what happened to the Persian Empire fits in exactly with what Daniel was told here. And Daniel was told this about 300 years before these things happened. 
So the question is, how could this be? How could this be other than the fact that the Bible really is what it claims to be? It's the word of God himself. But you see, we've only just scratched the surface. Daniel chapter 11 is a long chapter, as you can see. It's got 45 verses. And it's a remarkable prophecy about the various wars and conflicts that were going to take place down through time between the king of the north uh, in Syria and the kingdom of the south in Egypt. And it's an amazing and a very detailed prophecy. And history has proven that this prophecy is indeed accurate in every particular. Now, why should we be so, be so interested in the various wars that take place between these two kingdoms? What is the special significance of that? Well, the significance of it is this, that the, the buffer zone, if you like, between these two great kingdoms... The point of contact is this little country, the little land of Israel that's sandwiched right in the middle. And so time after time, as these two kingdoms, the kingdom of the north and the south, clashed, the tiny nation of Israel, piggy in the middle, bore the brunt of these clashes and suffered in the process. Now, unfortunately, we haven't really got the time to look at this prophecy in any great detail tonight. So what I want us to do now is to, is to zoom forwards in time, so to speak, to verse 40. Because we read here about a period called the time of the end. And this, we believe, is the period of time that we are living in today. And you'll notice from what we read here that the king of the north and the king of the south are very much still in existence at the time of the end. Of the end. And there's conflict between these two kingdoms once again. Let's just pick up verse 40. We're going to miss a few bits out, so perhaps it will be easier for you to follow these words on the screen. It says there that at the time of the end, Shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, and with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall also enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. So let's just summarize what we've learned there about what this king of the north is going to do in the time of the end, according to this prophecy. First of all, it says that he's going to enter into the glorious land. And that's, that's a Bible term for the land of Israel. It also says that the land of Egypt will not escape. And Egypt is, after all, the, the geographic location, as we've seen, of the king of the south. So the land of Egypt, it says, will not escape. We learn that the king of the north is actually going to set up a center of operations in the land of Israel. It says that he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace in the glorious holy mountain. But at the end of it all, it says, right at the end of verse 45, he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So what is being described here, amongst other things, is nothing less than a full-scale invasion of the land of Israel, the glorious land, by this power called the King of the North, which, in historic terms, was located in Syria. 
Well, just hold that thought, and let's go now to the second prophecy I'd like us to have a look at, which is the one that we read together at the beginning from Ezekiel chapter 38. Because Ezekiel chapter 38 is, is really an amplification of Daniel's prophecy of the invasion of the land of Israel by the king of the north at the time of the end. How do we know that? Well, let me just show you some of the, the, the similarities between these two prophecies, and you'll see that they are, in fact, speaking about the same thing. We saw that Daniel chapter 11 talks about this time called the time of the end. And in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 16, he says that it shall be in the latter days. Daniel 11 talks about the king of the north coming down into the land of Israel. And this is also the theme of of Ezekiel chapter 38, as you can see from verses 15 and 16. He says, it shall come, thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts against my people of Israel. So it's talking about an invasion of Israel from the north, just like it was in Daniel chapter 11. Now Daniel chapter 11, we saw, said, right at the end of the prophecy, yet shall he come to his end and none shall help him. And likewise, if you just have a look at Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 4, we learn here that this invasion of Israel from the north will ultimately lead to failure. It says, thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. And so there's clear parallels between these two Old Testament prophecies. They're both dealing with the same event to take place in the latter days. But what is really interesting is, is that Ezekiel chapter 38 goes into much more specific information regarding the exact identity of this northern invading power. And it's here in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 2, where God says, to Ezekiel, son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back, and will put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And so Ezekiel tells us here that this northern invader is called, verse 2, Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech, and Tubal. And we know that historically these were the names of a number of ancient Scythian tribes that existed during the time of the prophet Ezekiel, who incidentally lived at the same time as Daniel the prophet. But we've also seen, from what Ezekiel says, that this is a prophecy of the latter days. So although these ancient Scythian tribes existed in the days of the prophet Ezekiel, this is nevertheless, Ezekiel says, a prophecy of the latter days. So what we need to know is which modern nation, which latter day nation occupies the territories, the geographic territories of these, of these ancient tribes. And the answer is, that beyond all reasonable doubt, these ancient Scythian tribes correspond to the modern-day nation that we now know as Russia. Now, I don't want to bore you with an in-depth analysis of these ancient tribal names, but if you consult 
the experts in ancient history, you will find that these ancient tribes of Magog, Meshech, and Tubal inhabited the region that we now call Russia. Here's a map of the ancient world as it was known uh, about the 5th century BC. So this is roughly about the time of the prophet Ezekiel. And here are these ancient tribes. There they are. And you can see that in broad terms, they occupy the region that we would now recognize as modern Russia. In fact, it is possible that the ancient name of Russia may in fact be hidden away here in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 2. Because there, in verse 2, the prophet mentions Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. The chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And the Old Testament, of course, was originally written in the Hebrew language. And in the Hebrew, the word for chief is the Hebrew word rosh. And lots of language experts have looked at this word, and actually a lot of them believe that this is actually a proper name. And some Bible versions actually render it as a proper name. And so the revised version, for example, says, Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. And it may well be that Rosh is in fact an ancient name for Russia. Here's the opinion of a, a, a respected Hebrew scholar. He says, concerning this word, this Hebrew word Rosh, he says that it refers undoubtedly to the Russians who are mentioned by the Byzantine writers of the 10th century under the name of the Ross. Now, what is true, that there is debate about this, but what is certainly true is that there were peoples known as the Ross living in the region north of the Black Sea very early on in history. But the point is that we don't have to rely on this fact in our identification of the northern invader because the ancient tribes of Magog, Meshech, and Tubal that are mentioned there in verse 2 without doubt occupied the region now incorporated into Russia. So it would seem then that this invasion of the land of Israel in the latter days, predicted here by Ezekiel the prophet, is going to be orchestrated by Russia. Now with that in mind, did you notice what it says in verse 15? Verse 15, it says, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee. Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. And in fact, some Bible versions, including the revised version that I have here, say, Thou shalt come from thy place out of the uttermost parts of the north. Now, if you travel north from Jerusalem, from Israel, you get, first of all, of course, to Lebanon. But Lebanon isn't really the uttermost parts of the north, is it? But Russia is. Because did you know that if you stand in Jerusalem and travel due north, eventually you will reach Moscow. The capital city of Moscow is due north of the city of Jerusalem. So let's just stop there for a moment and, and see if we can pull things together. What, what we're saying is that the Bible talks about a time when the nation of Israel is going to be invaded by this great northern power. And we believe that this power, identified by Ezekiel, is the power of Russia. But hang on a minute, because in Daniel chapter 11, we saw that historically the king of the north is Syria, and so it is. So in Bible prophecy terms, 
Russia is not strictly speaking the king of the north until she has a presence in Syria. And so we would expect from Bible prophecy that Russia and Syria would have to somehow come together. And here is the significance, we believe, of what is happening in Syria at the moment. Because the current civil war has drawn Russia into the conflict. Over the past few days, Russia has developed this formidable military presence in Syria. And so I believe that what we're witnessing at the moment is the fact that Russia is assuming the role of king of the north. Now, if we look at Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 5, we shall see that the northern invader, which we believe to be Russia, will have a number of allies in the latter days when the invasion of the land of Israel takes place. Look at verse 5. It says, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. So Russia is going to have some national allies. Now, for tonight's purposes, I want us to just focus on one of these countries mentioned here, and that's Persia. Because, of course, ancient Persia corresponds today to the country of Iran. And so, again, in view of current events, things that are happening right now, this is really interesting because, of course, Iran is one of Russia's allies in the current fighting in Syria. And so what we're seeing in the Middle East at the moment is the development of national alliances that we would expect from these ancient biblical prophecies. Now, what sort of response has this generated from the land of Israel, from the Jews? Well, to say that the Israelis are getting a bit twitchy is a bit of an understatement. Mr. Netanyahu and President Putin had a meeting recently and Putin, it seems, went out of his way to try to allay Israel's concerns about Russia's presence in Syria. Apparently, according to Mr. Putin, Israel has nothing to fear from Russia. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says otherwise. Now, the question is, why should Israel want, sorry, why should Russia want to invade Israel? What's, what's in it for them? Well, let's see what the prophet Ezekiel says to us in verse 11. He says, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey and to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. So that's why Russia is going to come down into the land of Israel to take a spoil, it says, and to take a prey. Now what could that spoil, that prey, possibly be referring to, we wonder? Well, here's a suggestion. In 2010, the Israelis discovered an enormous gas field in the Mediterranean, off the coast of Haifa. And this is currently being developed. It's been called Leviathan. It's so big that it's been called Leviathan. And together with the near, nearby Tamar gas field, the Leviathan field is seen as an opportunity for the nation of Israel to become a major energy player in the Middle East. Only a few days ago, in fact, I think it was in the news again today, this announcement hit the headlines. The Israelis have now discovered oil in the Golan Heights. And if these finds live up to 
expectations, then Israel is likely to become very rich in keeping with Ezekiel's description here. Of course, the interesting thing about the Golan Heights is that this is contested territory with none other than Syria. So this is all very interesting. But the point is that all of this is likely to be highly attractive to Russia, a nation that currently uh, provides much of the natural gas and oil for many of the nations of Western Europe. So could this be, we wonder, could this be the great spoil that entices Russia to come down into Israel? Well, it seems reasonable, and, but we should just have to wait and see. But here's another interesting thought. Back in Daniel chapter 11, the prophet said that when the king of the north comes down and makes his move, it says that the land of Egypt shall not escape. And of course, the land of Egypt is where the king of the south used to reside. And so there's to be a resurrection of this old conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. And Israel is going to get caught in the crossfire once again. So we could ask the same thing about Egypt. What does Egypt have that Russia could possibly want? Well, on the 30th of August this year, the BBC re reported this story. The discovery of a huge gas field off the Egyptian coast. One of the biggest gas fields that have ever been discovered. And according to this report, this could represent uh, one of the, the largest gas finds ever found. And it could certainly help to meet Egypt's gas needs for decades. And so yet another possible enticement for energy-hungry Russia. Now I'd like us to have a look now at Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 8. And I want us to see how the nation of Israel is described in this chapter at the time when this invasion from the north takes place. Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 8 says, After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And so when this northern invasion takes place, Ezekiel says that the nation of Israel will be one that has been brought back from the sword, that's been gathered out of many people, and brought out of the nations. Now just think about the nation of Israel today, because this is a perfect description of the modern state of Israel. It, Israel is a nation that has been brought back from the sword. The people of Israel have been gathered out of many people. The land of Israel was waste, but is now inhabited. You know, we sometimes forget this, that because Israel is in the news pretty much every day these days, we sometimes forget that the modern state of Israel that we know about has only existed since 1948. See, the state of Israel is a modern miracle. Prior to 1948, there was no nation of Israel. The Jewish nation actually ceased to exist way back in time, about 70 AD, shortly after the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, when the mighty Roman armies came down and destroyed Jerusalem and carried the Jews off into captivity. And for nearly 2,000 years, the Jews were scattered throughout nearly every nation of the world. And the land of Israel, or Palestine as it was then known, lay in ruins. But then in 1948, something remarkable happened because the state of Israel was reborn against all the odds. And in the midst of considerable opposition 
from Arab, surrounding Arab nations. And since that time, since 1948, the state of Israel has grown to become a prosperous nation. The land has been cultivated and cities have been built. The nation has flourished in spite of continued and sustained hostility from her neighbours. Hostility that carries on even to the present day. And in fact, it's been in the news again today. And this is all in fulfilment of what Ezekiel the prophet says here. So the rebirth of the nation of Israel itself is a fulfilment of Bible prophecy. This prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38 could have been fulfilled at no other time in history other than our own days. And I think that's a remarkable thought. But you see, the message of such prophecies as Ezekiel 38 and Daniel chapter 11 is that Israel's troubles are not yet over. Yes, the rebirth of the nation of Israel is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, but that is a prelude to a greater time of trouble yet to come. Because the Bible tells us that the king of the north is going to come down like a cloud to cover the land, it says, and he's going to plant the tabernacles of his palace in the glorious holy mountain. And we believe that the recent developments in Syria indicate that this great event may well take place very soon. And so we're now in the position where Russian military hardware is in Syria, right on the border of the nation of Israel. Well, what of the future then? Because we've, we've seen from these prophecies that whilst it's true that the northern invasion of Israel will initially be successful, ultimately, the Bible tells us that it will fail. Daniel said that the king of the north will come to his end and none shall help him. And Ezekiel here in chapter 38 tells us that he will fall upon the mountains of Israel. So how will that come about? And what will be the final outcome? Well, this is where I want us to turn to our final reference, and it's from Zechariah's prophecy, toward, right towards the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 14. Now, this chapter begins by once again describing for us the troubles that are going to overtake the nation of Israel in the latter days. Zechariah chapter 14, and it says in verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So this is describing this same event, the invasion of the land of Israel. Notice, interestingly, in verse 1, the spoil referred to there, which ties this up with what we've read in Ezekiel chapter 38. So this is the invasion of Israel by the king of the north and her allied nations, Gog of the land of Mago, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And this, Zechariah tells us, will be a successful invasion because it says there in verse 3 that the city shall be taken. The city, the city of Jerusalem, shall be taken. But then notice what happens next in verse 3. It says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And so it's at this point, according to the prophet Zechariah, that God himself will intervene in the affairs of men. And he will do so by sending his son, 
the Lord Jesus Christ to save the people of Israel from certain destruction. You see, as far as God is concerned, the nation of Israel is special. Because thousands of years ago, God made a series of promises to the ancient forefathers of the nation of Israel, to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God made promises to those people. And God intends to keep his promises. And that will involve the establishment of an everlasting kingdom on the earth by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the establishment of the city of Jerusalem as the future world capital. And in fact, the prophet Zechariah speaks about this later on in verse 9. Where he says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. And then in verse 16 he says that it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations that come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. You see, the Bible teaches us that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth. And in that day, he will establish on the earth the kingdom of God. And that will be a period of unprecedented peace and prosperity for all peoples, not just the nation of Israel. And the Bible has an awful lot to say about what it will be like in the kingdom of God. And what, what is clear is that it will be a wonderful time. It will be a time of great blessing. Just look at these well-known words from Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 2. Talking about the kingdom. It says that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so what's immediately apparent from those words is that the world in the kingdom of God will be a vastly different place to the world that we know now. And the good news for you and me is that God invites us to inherit the kingdom. He wants us to be there with the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God to enjoy the blessings of that age and to receive the greatest blessing of all, the blessing of eternal life. And all the indications are, ladies and gentlemen, that this day is fast approaching. Russia is on the move. The nations are poised, as it were, for the final showdown. And that must mean that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is at hand. And so the important thing for us today, in the days that remain, is to make sure that we're ready, that we're prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must understand and believe the gospel so that we're prepared for that great day and so that we can be when Jesus comes, invited into the kingdom.